introduction. Uh, uh, I expected a small audience uh, since it is getting to the uh, very end of the semester. Uh, but basically, uh, today I'm talking about a, uh, an update of one of the chapters in our book on, on suicide movies that just came out late last year which has to do with a comparison of British and American film. Uh, this is actually about the only study that exists so far on a large number of films from sort of a sociological slash humanities perspective, and about the only one that exists on comparing British and American films. Uh, uh, this is part of a long-term project on suicide movies, which started when I was a humanities scholar uh, with Walter's group. Uh, in 2003, we started to try to locate a large number and ultimately every single suicide movie in the history of American film. So it's taken a long time, but I think we found just about all of them. Uh, in all, we have 1,377 suicides in American feature films that have a completed suicide. They were left out the suicide attempts and people are just thinking about it to make things more manageable. In addition, a few years later, I got the idea that we probably should see whether or not the patterns that we're finding in these films are the same in other countries. And so, we also started to collect British films, and we found 135 uh, suicides in British films for purpose of comparisons. We um, pretty much let the films speak for themselves. Some of the films have some really bizarre suicides. Uh, uh, the most bizarre one, which is actually not an American film, is called The Suicide Club, where 53 Japanese schoolgirls hold hands and they jump in front of a subway and there was all some blood and it's just a terrible scene. Uh, the largest suicide in the history of suicide movies uh, in a Japanese film. So some of, some of them are um, kind of bizarre, but a lot of them actually have a lot of parallels to real life situations. Uh, basically, letting the film speak for themselves, we ultimately could fit them into seven broad categories, like the psychiatric cases of people with depression, uh, but also um, cases of altruism. There's another whole bunch of films where somebody commits suicide for the benefit of somebody else, uh, which is a category Durkheim, the great sociologist of the 1800s, talks about at some length. Uh, so that Jimmy Cagney jumps on a hand grenade to save his buddies in the uh, film, The Fighting 69, which I think is like 1940 or something like that. But you have, you have films that uh, uh, link suicide to helping other people out, which is something we didn't expect that much. Uh, the, the, the real bullet point to uh, the book is, is that Film tends to stress the social causes of suicide, which may make psychiatry uh, unhappy, but for whatever reason, films tend to link suicide to external events, like somebody dies. In a lot of Shakespearean plays, somebody dies, uh, like in Hamlet, uh, Ophelia's father is killed uh, by Hamlet, by accident, and then she just goes berserk. Uh, commit suicide ultimately. Uh, so the things that happen externally seem to drive most of the suicides, uh, more than half of them in American film, not so much psychiatric causes. In the scientific literature, it's, a, it's depression, 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 depression causes suicide. But in film, and actually also in literature, there are these external events that seem to take priority. Okay, so there's our book. Uh, I was thinking about bringing a big barrel of popcorn. <laughs> uh, 
couldn't see the manager. Uh, that's our major product. We also have some articles coming out. We've delivered about 12 conference papers on uh, aspects of the book as it, as it was developing. We had papers and out of all that, more or less came to book. Okay. These are the seven master categories of suicide that come out as patterns. We let the film speak for themselves, and this is what we found. Uh, traditional psychiatric causes like long-term depression, you have, uh, like in the hours, you have Virginia Woolf, who's been, you know, uh, heavily depressed for years and years and has had psychiatric care, and she's starting to hear voices again. She has signs of schizophrenia. You know, she has like this long history that she's been tormented uh, by these demons of the mind. And she ultimately walks into the River of Bronze. Uh, those sorts of films actually only account for about one out of five suicides in American uh, film. One really surprising uh, aspect of film was this, that about almost an equal number, about one out of five films, look at a, the psychopath. Like somebody that is a serial killer, like in the film Seven, that we'll just take a brief look at. Uh, it's very aggressive, no remorse, and fearless, perhaps. About one fifth of the films. F physicality or disability, pain and illness, like in the film The Elephant Man. How many have heard of The Elephant Man? Yeah. Uh, like deformity, works uh, behind. Uh, only about 7% of the suicides, but that's, that's quite a, a large number. That's like about 85 suicides. These are all individual centered causes. And then we have the extra individual or social causes, including economic strain, like loss of a fortune. Especially back in the 1920s and 30s, there were a lot of films where somebody lost everything on the stock market and then they killed themselves. You got violent death of a loved one, like in Hamlet. Uh, social strain is actually the largest category. And the most common thing is rejection of love. Somebody gets dumped, uh, which dates all the way back to ancient art. There's a lot of depictions of that. Uh, and then altruism for the benefit of others. Some people feel like they're a burden on others, and they kill themselves in the film just as they do to a lesser extent in society. Like a lot of old people, about 20 to 30 percent, depending on what uh, study you look at, 20 to 30 percent of the elderly report in their suicide notes to other people. They feel like a burden, and so they commit suicide, in part, out of altruism. And you find that in almost in one out of every five films. Um, <clears throat> So anyway, these are the seven themes. These are the big seven, like the Magnificent Seven. These are the patterns that stood out. And there's actually subcategories, but we don't have enough time to go into the subcategories. OK, today I'm basically looking at, at two questions. One is, these seven patterns in American films, do we find that they replicate in British films? Or are they like universal? patterns or idioms, maybe cultural idioms that uh, uh, are in both uh, countries. And we'll mostly show five out and five out of seven. Whoops. And five out of seven uh, cases, I don't have that there. Uh, the patterns are similar. They're not significantly different. And the other two are pretty close. So the we have something called a globalization process, which is just basically a notion that uh, the films, the suicide films from different countries may be actually similar in what they're saying about what causes suicide. And that's pretty much what we find. Question two, uh, we raise the question, uh, well, where does that come from? How come like, these two countries are different in a lot of ways, but their suicide movies are very similar? What accounts for that? And we uh, entertain uh, a literary roots hypothesis that the 
two countries share a common, tra common traditions in literature, in popular world literature. Uh, we're able to show that um, for five of the seven motives, the percentage of master works of literature like Shakespeare and the Greek tragedies and so on are saying pretty much the same thing uh, five out of seven times uh, about what causes suicide as today's movies. So it's like uh, almost like some kind of master plot or something that uh, all the uh, actors and producers and script writers uh, that are producing these films uh, are, are perhaps relying on a long tradition in literature and art that goes back 2,000 years. Okay, uh, I'm going to basically just uh, show you uh, some of them I'm going to have to go through pretty quick because I don't have enough time. Uh, <clears throat> well, we'll look at a, uh, a brief case study of an American film and a British film on each one of the seven causes just to give you an idea of, you know, how the cases match up, and then look at a quantitative table, just a little table of percentages, to see whether or not the percentage of British films that, say, emphasize psychiatric causes is about the same as a percentage of American films that have psychiatric causes uh, linked to suicide. And then the literary roots, uh, we'll look at uh, 108 suicides in popular world literature, these are basically the ones that have cliff notes. Uh, how many ever use cliff notes? I have to confess that I, I have used cliff notes. Okay. Uh, it's, it's something of a problem as a sociologist. How do you define popular works of literature? Like uh, Walter here would probably you know, fight for his favorite hundred and uh, Emily, a student from the English department, she might fight for her favorite hundred, and I might fight for mine. We might not have much over that. Uh, so I figure that the uh, cliff notes are the ones that are probably read the most. Uh, and they're not the only ones that are read a lot, but at least it gives you maybe a representative sample of uh, the major works of popular world literature. When, and we looked at those and uh, pulled out the suicides. Uh, I think about a quarter of the quarter of the major works of popular world literature have a suicide, in it, which is actually a high percentage. Uh, and we looked at um, whether or not the causes of suicide in those 108 literary uh, suicides match up with the causes of suicide in film. And we find that five out of seven of them do, which is almost kind of scary in this 2,000 years. Uh, of literary traditions come out in a century of film. Okay, so the first question is the distribution of the seven causes of suicide in American films similar to that in British film? We show that it's mostly, yes, five out of seven match up, and the other two are not dramatically different. Uh, first, you look at the individual level causes, the causes within the individual. Basically, uh, mental disorders and physical illness. Uh, the traditional psychiatric perspective on suicide says that suicide is, uh, this is oversimplified, mainly a result of uh, major depression and schizophrenia. Those are the two leading psychiatric disturbances, and also substance abuse. So Virginia Woolf's suicide is uh, documented or presented in The Hours, which was Emily's favorite uh, suicide movie, one of my favorites. And British films include Sylvia, Sylvia Plath, the British, famous British poet. So um, actually a disproportionately large number of these films are on artists, including true stories of artists for whatever reason. That's just sort of an aside. Uh, so we have the hours. Uh, Virginia Woolf was in a struggle. I keep getting the clicker and stuff up the uh, She was been suffering from long-term depression for many, many years, and just kind of 
worn out, couldn't take it anymore, started to hear voices again. So she ends her life. Uh, there's also some altruism in her suicide because she says, uh, I cannot go on spoiling your life any longer. That's a set sentence from her actual suicide note. So that she feels like a burden. So here there's some uh, comorbidity. Uh, it's not just psychiatric causes, but it's also altruism kind of pops in. And most of the movies, there's at least two causes, sometimes as many as seven. Uh, so what I'm getting is sort of an oversimplification, but about one out of five movies have at least uh, one reference to a psychiatric cause linked to suicide. In some of the movies, it's pretty, there's some pretty dramatic. This is uh, uh, Nicolas Cage on his way drinking to death, like quarter after quarter of hard liquor. He actually commits suicide by drinking himself to death in Las Vegas. Uh, he's an alcoholic, but he's also divorced, he's unemployed, and he's also deaf. So he's got a lot of problems besides his alcoholism. How many saw the, that film, Leaving Las Vegas? It's, uh, some of these films are more than others. Most of, them, most of them are not really big box office hits, frankly, because uh, we looked at everything. Uh, Sylvia Plath, how many uh, are familiar with Sylvia Plath suicide? Okay, yeah. Uh, so she um, had uh, psychiatric problems, but this also, uh, like she was talking about how she longed for blackness and death and that kind of thing, but there's also a, something of a strain in a marital relationship with the uh, use. So again, you have some comorbidity. There's a lot been written about her suicide, and it seems like it's a mixture, and there's a debate over whether it's the psychiatric or the social uh, factors that best account for her suicide. But anyway, you, you find that in uh, a good number of British films. Uh, the uh, quantitative analysis, uh, you can see that the uh, percentage of British films that, are, that attribute suicide to psychiatric problems is almost identical to that found in American films. It's kind of scary. Uh, so there, it seems like there are reflecting the same thing, maybe patterns of image. The psychopath was something that we didn't anticipate, but letting the film speak for themselves, a large percentage, about, I think 18 percentages of the suicides in American films had to do with uh, the psychopath, uh, which psychiatrists now call the antisocial personality disorder. It's one of 10 personality disorders in access to uh, the DSM-4. Uh, to be a psychopath, you have to meet three of seven criteria. Uh, we found that it was relatively easy to do because almost all the psychopaths killed somebody and they didn't feel bad about it. And that meets two characteristics. That me actually meets three characteristics, crime, aggression, and lack of remorse. And so it's pretty easy to find the psychopaths in the film because most of them kill people and they feel no guilt. Those are the seven characteristics, but basically uh, one, four, and seven come out again and again and again and again in these films. Uh, how many saw the film seven? Okay, there you have a serial killer, uh, this guy here, Kevin Spacey, and he's just severed the head of Brad Pitt's wife, except Brad Pitt doesn't know it yet. That's where all his blood came from. He's uh, killed six people that represent the uh, seven sins, and he's on crusade to uh, change the world, and he has this illusion that he's going to be in like an international hero that everyone would remember because it never happens. That's his illusion. 
uh, ultimately, uh, he's surrendering to the police, but it's all part of a plot. He wants to punish Brad Pitt for the sin of revenge, the wrath, the seventh deadly sin is wrath. Uh, Brad Pitt just opened the box that has his wife's head in it, and of course he goes berserk, loses control, and uh, all the while he's trying to get him to shoot him, which is a suicide by cop who's provoking the police to kill him, in which Brad Pitt does a suicide by cop. We have a real uh, hardcore psychopath who feels no guilt at all about killing these people because he's on a crusade uh, to stop the seven deadly sins. Uh, here we have a British film, Felicia's Journey. Has anyone seen Felicia's Journey? It was popular in Britain. A lot, a lot of these British films were popular over there, but they didn't really do well over here. Uh, this guy here, he looks sort of normal, maybe, but he's a, uh, another serial killer. And he picks up girls, mostly runaways, like this one here, and he uh, seduces them and murders them. So I'm not, he feels no guilt about it. He's you know, a serial killer. Okay, and basically there's not much of a difference. Uh, I, I was surprised that the British have uh, somewhat more. It's not enough to be statistically significant, which is what we do in social science. Uh, but these percentages are pretty close. So again, the globalization hypothesis is supported. British and American films are alike on the second cause that comes out again and again in the films. Physicality uh, has to do with pain, intolerable pain, uh, terminal illnesses, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, I really saw this. This was John Wayne's last film, Shoes, 1976. Uh, okay, well, uh, and during this film, he was dying of cancer. John Wayne was actually dying of cancer, and they had to stop the film three times for like a, a week because he was in such agonizing pain. And he plays the part of somebody that's dying of abdominal cancer, stomach cancer, in the movie. Uh, James Stewart, who was a big star in his day, also was a doctor. And this is him telling John Wayne that he should not die an agonizing death of pain. But he was a brave man. And he should not die like all the other cancer patients, which was a big hint. And so what John Wayne does is he organizes a shootout with all of the fastest guns in the territory. And he invites them independently to meet him at the saloon on his birthday. And then there's this bloodbath. And he dies courageously like he wanted. So it's sort of a suicide by alcohol. Uh, how many saw this film, Million Dollar Baby? Okay, that's more recent, so get more hands. Uh, as you know, uh, this is the rising star female boxer. Unfortunately, she her neck is broken in the ring, and she ends up like this. And uh, she begs Clint Eastwood to end her life. So it's sort of a, an assisted suicide. The Elephant Man is probably the most famous British film on physicality. Here we have somebody that was abused for many years in a freak show. This is the actual real Elephant Man. This is like a true story. Uh, one of the true story films the best. Uh, but he gets sicker and sicker and sicker. And he knows he's going to die. And he doesn't want to wait to die a miserable death. So he has this huge head. And for years, he slept sitting up because if he lies down and his head falls the wrong way, he just gets congested and dies. And so he lies down very peacefully, sort of matter-of-factly, uh, knows he's going to die. And he just lets his big head glide off of the bed, and then he gets congested and dies. 
so it's a uh, kind of a heartbreaking film, but it's another uh, uh, example of uh, physicality, what we call physicality, physical illness driving suicides. Uh, there was no significant difference. Uh, it's really scary in a way. Uh, 6.7 of the British film suicides were due to that versus 6.9 in the United States. So now we're up to three. Uh, so far, there's no difference uh, between the films of Britain and the films of the United States. Okay, the second part, we look at the four social causes, death of a loved one, social strains, economic strains, and altruism. Okay, uh, one of the things you can learn from these films is uh, that the deaths have to be violent deaths. In suicide research for many, many years, uh, there's been mixed findings in the empirical literature because researchers like me, we just look at whether or not the deceased had a significant other that died. And no one ever really thought maybe what we should really be doing is look at unexpected violent deaths like homicides and automobile crashes, things that happen all of a sudden, you know, you're not really ready for it. Whereas most deaths, somebody's dying of cancer maybe like over two years, or a heart disease over months, if not years, and so you sort of expect it. But in violent deaths, it's like a shock. It happens unexpectedly all of a sudden. And in film, that's the kind of death that drives suicide. So this was like a big uh, breakthrough for me looking at film. Film is saying it's going to be a violent death. And so uh, it's a good avenue for future empirical research. When we saw this, The House of Sam and Fog, this made, to, made it up to about number 70 in the box office. This is a Fairly well-known film. Uh, ben Kingsley plays a uh, ex-Iranian colonel that escaped Iran and was going to like kill uh, the state. So he comes to this country and he uh, doesn't couldn't get a job. He, it's like a ditch digger, and he's like barely making it. But he puts all of his hopes in his son. His son's like a newspaper boy, and uh, they you know. But I can't make it in American society. They don't need Iranian colonels here. But my son will. He'll be a doctor. And so they're all excited about their son doing well in school and working his way up. But then, it's a long story. His son is accidentally killed by the police. And he just goes to pieces. And when his son uh, dies, he commits suicide with a plastic bag at the end of the movie. Uh, this is a really good film, uh, Painted Angels. Has anyone ever seen this? This is one of my favorite films. But it's like a really realistic portrayal of a brothel, a brothel life on the Great Plains in like the 1850s somewhere. Uh, it's, it's really a tearjerker. Th this, um, this person here, Eileen, is endured employment and is a prostitute in the Old West. They have scenes in there like where they have four uh, prostitutes and there's like literally on Saturday night about a hundred cattlemen come and they're waiting in line and the line goes like all the way down the stairs and in the living room and out into the street. They're all waiting for their turn. Uh, so it's kind of really dehumanizing. But she's been putting up with that for one reason. She's saving her money so she can go back to art and be with her family and support them with all this money that she's saving. But she hears one day uh, that during the Irish potato famine, all of her family is perished. She learns that. They're all gone. Not even one is left. They're all dead. Uh, she said that just one had survived, that would give her hope. But they all died. And so she decides uh, to commit suicide with her. And they go into a suicide pact 
God and drink poison uh, to end their lives. Okay, um, well it turns out here there is a significant difference. Uh, but in British films, there are more uh, suicides connected with death than American films. A lot more. And I'm still trying to figure that one out, but I think it's because there's more Shakespearean, more uh, uh, renditions of plays like Hamlet. Like we only have a few, but in Britain they had something like 12 renditions of Hamlet. People, uh, Ophelia committing suicide because her father was killed. I think that they're closer to the Shakespearean plays and some of the Greek plays too, like Antigone. They have more renditions. But other than that, I don't really know why that's the case. But that is a, that is the major exception to the globalization hypothesis that the British like death in their suicide films or in the Americans. Social strain includes uh, things like rejection and love, adultery, domestic violence. Uh, here we have a really good portrayal of uh, domestic violence. This is one of my favorite images. I mean, you can see like her, she's shaking. He's being yelled at by uh, James Earl Jones. Uh, and this is a true story. I like the true story films. Uh, but he was a uh, fantastic boxer, but all the other boxers were white. And he would just knock them down, one after the other. I mean, nobody could defeat him. And so there started to be race riots. This was like in the early 1900s. He would beat a, uh, a white opponent, and then all the whites would have a race riot. And so they banned him from the ring unless he agreed to throw a fight. And he didn't want to do that. So they lived out in Mexico in real poverty. They had some really uh, impoverished people in places uh, in the film footage. And uh, he tells her to go back to her people. She doesn't like living in poverty and wants them to throw a fight. And after this skirmish here, uh, she jumps down well to her death. So you have this history of domestic violence that just got worse and worse, especially when they were living in poverty in Mexico. Uh, domestic violence is something that suicide researchers curiously haven't really studied yet. Well, you find a lot of it in film. So you get researchers like me can get all kinds of good ideas from watching these films and for, you know, for doing research. Uh, there's other kinds of social strains. One very common one is the lover's triangle. This is another true story. Uh, has anyone ever heard of Joy Division? They were like uh, one of the leading bands in Britain in the 1970s, late 70s. And this is uh, uh, Ian Curtis was their star. He was a singer. He wrote all the lyrics and sang the lyrics. But he, uh, he couldn't give up his affair with a female admirer, a Nick. And finally his wife said, I'm divorcing you. I can't stand this threesome anymore. Enough is enough. And so then he hangs himself. Uh, and it's actually a true story. But you find that in, there's a good number of movies where it's usually a man has two lovers, usually a wife and a mistress. And the wife says, no more of this, enough is enough. And then the man commits suicide. Fine, it's kind of a small undercurrent in a film, and also in real life. Uh, and basically, uh, if you count them all up, there's almost no difference. There's not a significant difference in the reliance on uh, lovers' triangles, rejection of love in British and American films. They're very, very similar. And this is the most important of the seven causes. It's basically problems in intimate relationships. And in society, we find the same thing. Problems in intimate relationships uh, are basic to understanding suicides. Then there's economic strain. This has to do with things like unemployment, poverty, job demotion, 
all sorts of stuff, bankruptcy, uh, home foreclosures. These things, you find these in film, but there's almost no research on things like eviction. Uh, there's only been two studies done on eviction and suicide. I did one, I helped out. Uh, but in film, there's like scores of films where somebody is evicted from their home and they feel alone and abandoned. Uh, that contributes to their suicide. Has anyone ever seen this film, The Assassination of Richard Nixon? It's probably the greatest film about economic strain ever made in the United States. Uh, but very few people have seen it, which is kind of unfortunate. Sean Penn plays uh, some of the typical alienated worker. He just does not like his job. He's, he sells furniture like this, and he's not very good at it. And his boss says, you've got to sell more, sell more, sell more. Listen to these tapes. And so he brings tapes home at night, and he listens to the tapes on how to sell furniture. And he still doesn't do very good. But his main dream is to smart, start his own small business. He doesn't like his boss. He doesn't like his job. He wants to do something else. And so um, he applies for a small business loan from the government. And Nixon is president of the government time. So he, every day he goes into his mailbox, he opens it up, he looks through the mail to see if the letter uh, giving him the loan is there. And one day, about nine months after he applied, the letter is there and it's uh, kind of like shaking. It's kind of like when I get a letter from a journal and, I look, and I'm wondering, did they accept my paper or not? I kind of look at it, maybe put it aside and open it maybe an hour later. Mm -hmm. and so he opens up the letter and his loan was rejected. And he's just really angry. And so he plans to assassinate the president, who he sees as the uh, person that makes everyone believe in the American dream. The president is like the American dream personified. And so he decides he's going to hijack a plane that's loaded with bombs, and he's going to fly it right into the White House. This precedes 9-11. Maybe this is where they got the right year. I don't know. You never can tell. Uh, but he messes up in his psychopathic plan, and he kills the pilots. Uh, and then he says, uh-oh, who's going to fly the plane? And his plot is spoiled. He can't even do that with him. And so uh, he ends up committing suicide. But most of the film is a really good portrayal of how somebody really hates their job. And they really want to work for themselves, but in the end they can't. They're stuck with the job that they hate. So it's a really good portrayal of alienation from work contributing to suicide. And that's something that suicide specialists like me hardly looked at. This is a uh, real famous uh, play. Uh, and Inspector Calls. How many of you have ever seen the Inspector Calls? Uh, Joseph Priestley. He, he was a, sort of like a Socialist Party guy in, uh, in Britain in the last century. Uh, this is probably the best British film on economic strain. There's a, uh, a woman called Eva Smith, and it's just one thing after another. She keeps getting jobs and she keeps getting fired uh, for unjust reasons. And ultimately, she's dumped by her uh, rich boyfriend, who's like a two-timer. He's dating her and then a rich girl. And the rich girl doesn't like it, so he dumps poor Eva, and she commits suicide. OK, again, uh, here, we're up to clause number six. There's not really much of a difference. Uh, it's really small, and it's not significant. So the British and the Americans are alike again in the extent to which they draw on economic strain as a cause of suicide, 16% of each country. And then finally, there's altruistic suicides. Now here, here we are going to find a difference, which is uh, interesting. I think I have an idea why it's 
wide, find the difference. So you can divide films up into civilian oriented and military oriented. So you got like Jimmy Cagney jumping on a hand grenade to save his buddies in the fighting 69. That's a military oriented one. And there's also civilian oriented uh, films that don't have much to do with war. Uh, here we have a civilian oriented film that was made here. How many saw Gran Torino? Okay. Uh, here I have Clint Eastwood, film icon. Uh, he's dying of cancer, so he's probably going to die anyway. But he decides to uh, go out in a blaze of glory, just like John Wayne, when some of these real macho uh, stars commit suicide. It's, also, it's often a blaze of glory kind of thing. He's fed up with violent gag attacks against his neighbors, and he decides the only way his neighbors will ever have any peace is to get the gang in jail. So he goes, he, he says, I'm going to light things up, and they think he's going for a gun. He goes in for his cigarette lighter that he's carried with him since the Korean War, pulls it out, and he's killed by a storm of bullets by all the gang members who have like Uzi's and heavy caliber uh, handguns. And so uh, the film ends, the police come and they put the cuffs on all the gang members and hopefully his uh, suicide by gang member will uh, help his neighbors live in peace. So it's an altruistic suicide, not in war. Uh, most of the American movies have scenes like this. Here's Jimmy Cagney about to jump on a hand grenade. And here we have Courage Under Fire. Has anyone seen Courage Under Fire? It's the only movie ever made with a woman soldier uh, committing altruistic suicide. So you have Meg Ryan. She's, uh, this is a, during the Gulf War, and she's told all of her men to leave and get on the helicopter, and she'll stay behind. Uh, she's already pretty seriously wounded. Uh, maybe she figures she's going to die anyway from her wounds, but she stays behind with her. M16 offers cover on fire so her, her uh, comrades in arms can escape. So she's giving her life for the benefit of others. In British film, uh, you don't have very many military, almost no military suicides uh, in British film. You got things like this. This is the saddest suicide movie ever made. Uh, the family is living in poverty. Uh, they keep getting thrown out of houses because it's like 1890 or something like that. And the uh, Jude and his wife uh, refuse to get married. They don't want to be married. They just want to live out of wedlock. And they're really obsessed with that. So they keep getting evicted when the landlord finds out they're not married. And it's also getting harder and harder for Jude to find employment because the townspeople don't like his uh, violating the norm of marriage and living outside of marriage. Uh, so there's not enough money. So the oldest child decides to hang his two siblings and then himself uh, because we are too many. That's the way uh, a young child spells many. Uh, it's based on a novel by Thomas Hardy. Uh, so we had a very sad situation. You have poverty and uh, suicide is uh, performed in order to help the family out. Okay, there is a difference here that's significant too. This is the other difference, and it's mainly because there's not nearly as many military oriented suicides in British film. That possibly the British culture is less militaristic, and there's actually some evidence that I have to back that up. But you do find uh, there is a difference here. And the British uh, basically don't glorify war and patriotism as much in their suicide films. Okay, question two is what common factor might account for the similarity that we found in question one? And the answer 
we think is at least in part literary traditions, a common literary tradition. As I pointed out before, there's a long tradition in literature, the Bible, the Samson, altruistic suicide, Julius Caesar, his assassins, here he is uh, going to Brutus in one film. All of these guys here are like psychopaths. They don't really feel much guilt for killing him. Here's Ophelia, a famous painting, uh, Hamlet, Death is a Cause of Suicide. And Anna Karmanina, uh, you can sort of see in this image here, she's not really very happy uh, with her marriage to this guy. Uh, so they have like, relationship problems. Uh, so we we looked at all 240 cliff notes, and we found that 66 of them were based on uh, works that had suicide, 27%. And they include Antigone, Oedipus the King, uh, Samson in the Bible, there's some in Dante's Infernos. There's a bunch of things, about 12 in Shakespearean tragedies, and 19th century novels, like quite a few. These are like what we think. Uh, are popular works, and probably not the only ones, but it gives you a representative sample of major literary works. Uh, so, in five out of seven uh, causes, there's not a significant difference in, uh, like, depression. Here the end is small, so this looks like it's a significant difference maybe, but since the end is only 108 literary work suicides, it's not significant. Psychopathology of a psychopath, not significant. Uh, you do find significant differences on death and relationship strain. This is not really a very large, but there's only two. The other ones, economic strain, altruism, physical illness, uh, psychiatric causes, and a psychopath. There's not a significant difference between uh, film and literature and how they explain suicide. So the, the patterns that you find in film are much more similar than different from the patterns that you find in world literature uh, going back 2,000 years. Here's a qualitative analysis. I'll blank things up with a qualitative analysis. So the psychiatric perspective on suicide, we weren't really able to find very much before Edith Wharton's House of Earth. Uh, that was like the first well-developed psychiatric perspective that we could find in popular works of literature, the 108 uh, we looked at. Lily Bart has a gambling addiction and drug addiction. They contribute to her suicide. It's, and it's comorbid with her downward spiral. She becomes poorer and poorer. She loses a job. So there's other things too. But this was the first piece we could find uh, on a psychiatric perspective. Uh, the psychopath, we have Julius Caesar being murdered by all these assassins uh, who just basically want his power and don't feel any guilt about murdering them. Uh, they finally commit suicide when they're cornered and about to be punished by the uh, armies of Mark Anthony, uh, which is very common in psychopath suicide. These guys basically only commit suicide when they're cornered and about to be punished. It's not like they're sorry for what they did. So about one out of every five films and about one out of every five literary works are like this. This is like part of the, the common set of understandings. Uh, physical illness and suicide. I think this is the first one. This is from a, this is like a secondary character in King Lear. How many have read King Lear? Oh, okay. Gloucester uh, has his eyes gouged out by one of his adversaries. And he also feels betrayed by his, uh, his son.